The solar PV industry is about to be changed forever by this new solar cell technology. And in today's video, we're gonna do a deep dive and find out what it's all about. So we're here at InterSolar in Munich 2025 to meet Oxford PV. You may have heard murmurings on the internet about a certain technology called perovskite, which is supposed to be a potential game changer for the solar panel and solar cell industry. YouTubers like Matt Farrell and others have posted deep dive videos about this technology, but we're here to see it in the flesh and find out more about how it actually works and how it might change things for solar installers and end users. So we're here with Dan, who's head of product from Oxford PV, and we're gonna pick his brains about this amazing and innovative product that we've been hearing so much about. So nice here to meet you. Here it is, yeah. Yeah, tell us. What is perovskite, first of all? <laughs> like, it's, it's, fan it's a fancy word, but yeah. what does it actually mean? Well, I, I think the word's got all these historical connotations. Basically, it was named after a Russian dude who lived in like the 1800s, basically. And okay. he discovered a, a mineral which had a certain structure. Turned out, 12 or so years ago, the guys in the physics lab in Oxford discovered the same crystal structure, but with a slightly different arrangement of materials, was actually useful for solar energy. And so they didn't have a new, new name for it, so they just called it by perovskite, which is actually the, 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 the way the atoms are arranged in the crystal. That's what gave it its name. Okay, so it's basically a crystal. It's a crystal. And how does this crystal make solar panels better? Well, I think that, that was a great discovery that was made about 12 years ago, was that this material that no one ever suspected, turns out it's actually brilliant at absorbing light and turning it into electricity. So okay. uh, we, we went on a journey from then about 12 years ago to say, how, how can we actually turn this from something you can do in a lab to something you can do in real life? And so we, we spent a lot of time honing that exact material, exact composition, and also how to put it down on a big area to make it actually relevant for like everyday use, not just something you have in a lab. So okay. uh, yeah, here we are with, with the, the fruit of uh, you know 12 years of work. There's something to actually look at and use in the real world. From a lab in the depths of Oxford <laughs> University yeah, to yeah, here yeah, in yeah. Munich with yeah. a real product, quite yeah. a journey. Indeed, yeah, it's been fun. Then. This is our subscriber renewable energy village. And if you'd like to be a part of this lovely little village, all you have to do is one thing, which really helps our channel. Hit that subscribe button. I've noticed that 75% of you who watch our videos regularly haven't yet subscribed. We'd really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button and become part of our lovely subscriber village. So how would you explain it in really simple terms as to like what perovskite does to the yeah. solar so cells? Al almost all solar cells. Um are based on silicon. Yep. What silicon does brilliantly is it, it captures light across all different colors of light. So whether it's like UV light, really blue, or really re infrared light, it gets it all and it uses it and turns it into electricity. Okay. What perovskite does differently is that it can take the high energy light, so the, the blue light, the green light, the visible light that we see, yeah. and convert it more effectively into electricity. So what we yeah. do then is we, we get a, a regular silicon cell like this, which is what you can see the outline of, yeah. and we build on top of that directly really thin layers which build up the perovskite cell. Okay. And so that perovskite cell then gets all that high energy light and makes the most of it. And then it also lets some light pass to the silicon which correct, collects the rest of the light and that you get basically a double junction, which is why we call it a tandem solar cell. It's two solar cells acting as one to really get make the most use of the light spectrum that's available. Amazing. Yeah. And what's the real world impact for you know yeah. solar installations? The real world impact is at the end of the day, you get more energy out of a given area. So our product is, uh, this is our first generation product. It's been released uh, last year. We, it's already been sold into some markets in the US. Uh, we're releasing a second generation product this year, which will have uh, more efficiency. And I think it, it's, it's a bit basic, but actually it's just this thing ends up being more efficient than a comparative silicon cell. So yeah. you can get more power out of a certain area. So when you stack lots of them in a farm or lots of them on your roof, you, you get more energy out at the end of it. In a world where solar modules are getting cheaper and cheaper, but actually land is expensive and cables are expensive and aluminium is expensive. If you can maximize the power you can get out of your panel, all those other cables and things, the, you, you get m most value for money for the whole system. And that's what we think we can do with these more efficient panels. So does silicon on its own kind of have a ceiling then? Because I still see a lot of yeah. improvements slowly with the efficiency yeah. of normal solar panels. And, and the, actually, it's one of the reasons we decided to go to work on silicon. We, we looked at what happened in the solar industry over the years and realized anyone who competes with silicon eventually loses out, right? Okay. Because 
it's a technology that's just got better and better and it's got cheaper and cheaper over the last 10 years. Uh, and it, it's trying to compete directly with it is, is really tough because you're right, it, it is reaching its limit. Yeah. So, the, I mean, it's, which is at a cell level about 27 point, you know, maybe 28% you can squeeze it up to. Yeah. Uh, but in a module level where you, you know, you always have some gaps between the modules and light can get through and things like that, maybe yeah. you can get to 25%. Okay. It's very hard to go beyond that. Yeah. But what we can do with Perovsco is that the headroom is more like 45% for a cell level. Wow. So we can, right now we think we have a cool product. Yeah. We know that in, in the medium term, three to five years, we're going to have a, an amazing product because yeah. it's just going to keep on getting better. Whereas silicon cells, they are brilliant. Don't get me wrong. We yeah. think it's, it's great, but we, we, we have the benefit. We don't just compete with them. We, we, we get all the benefits of a great silicon cell yeah. and then we add our material on top. So we're, we're not trying to compete directly. We're trying to use the best that they've got and, yeah. and then build on it and take it to the next level. So you're sort of just increasing the headroom for efficiency yeah, exactly. on panels and going from that ceiling of 25% yeah. right up to potentially like 40, 45%. Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're keeping solar wow. R&D in business for the next 20 years because, you know, yeah. it, it's, it is. We're, gonna, we're, we're looking forward to the day we can make a 30% module, which is just way out of reach of silicon. But, you know, yeah. one day, 10 years time, maybe it's a 35% module. And this is... It makes all sorts of new things possible, right? You, yeah. you know, to date, people don't stick solar panels on cars. Yeah. And one of the reasons it's like, well, you can only get so much power, but if you can get an extra 50% more power, then you'd be like, why don't we? Why don't yeah. we build a solar roof on our car? Let's, this can actually make a material difference to how this battery electric vehicle will work. And uh, you know, all, all sorts of other applications become you know, useful. Yachts that can actually be autonomous electric yachts rather than yeah. having to dock and fill up with diesel and you know, all sorts of different cool things that you can do when you make a step change like that. So, did you guys invent this technology at Oxford PV? Do you kind of own the rights to this? Like, yeah. what is your business yeah. model? Yeah, so we, we, we're really fortunate. We were a spin out from the uh, Oxford University yeah. where one of the, one of the co-discoverers of the material was based. So, Professor Henry Snaith, he was the, the guy that founded the company. And so, the, when this material came along, the company was like, right, let's, we're all in on this. So, let's try and, you know, we, we own now the uh, IP that was generated in the university. We've, of course, added to that our own IP over the last 12 years. Yeah. And so we, have, we do have one of our core pillars of the company is to use that IP uh, and not just use it for ourselves, but to enable this technology to get out there. So yeah. we, we're, we, we'd love to do everything ourselves, but we recognize this industry is massive, right? Yeah. It's a terawatt scale industry. We cannot do everything ourselves with just one company. So the way we want to see this technology get out there is Yes, partly by us doing it ourselves, but it's also licensing that technology to others to enable them to bring this technology to market in different locations around the world. So we've already done our first licensing deal where we've sold access to the IP to a, a, a big manufacturer of PV, which will mean that that can now come online in, 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 in one area of the world and we can do the same kind of things and replicate that. So how soon do you think it's going to be before we see perovskite being mm. the kind of standard that a lot of solar yeah. panel manufacturers are That's offering? It's a really good question. And I think one of the cool things we've seen in solar is a technology can, can go along at a level and, one, and then it reaches like a tipping point. Mm. And so it was the same with Perk, which is a, an old solar cell technology. It was the same with Topcon. It's, it's once people make that transition, everyone realizes actually everyone's got to switch to that. Yeah. So it, we, we hopeful and we, we think that is the future. Exactly when that tipping point comes and everyone goes, yes, it's now, yeah. uh, will depend on lot, lots of complicated things. How long does it take to spool up factories? How long does it take to buy all the machines in? Yeah. How long does it, there's a lot of infrastructure to come. But I think we know that the solar industry is, you know, it's still got lots and lots of room to grow to, if we want to get to really a, you know, fully renewable electricity system by 2050, which is all of our hopes, right? We want to yeah. see that. Uh, kind of global transformation, uh, there's going to be a heck of a lot more solar panel power that's needed. And I think it's a good time for perovskites now to come online before we get to that multi terawatt kind of uh, power generation scenario that we're hoping for. Yeah. Now, a lot of our audience are early adopters and they yeah. always want the latest and yeah, best yeah. thing. So as soon as they see a new panel yeah, like yeah. this, they're like, I want one. Yeah, yeah. Are these readily available now? And like, how, how much more expensive are yeah, they yeah. and how much more efficient are they currently? Yeah, good question. So right now we're, we're making these available only to like uh, business to business kind of transactions. Yeah. We, we do get a lot of people want, I really want this on my roof. And actually I want it on my roof, but yeah. I still haven't got it on my roof. Yeah. But we, 
right now these panels are quite expensive, right? Because we're not manufacturing in the volume that you, you need to to get all the economies of scale. So yeah. when we do those kind of deals, it's, it's usually on a win-win basis. So we make it available to a commercial customer who's, who's thinking about the future. The, yeah. the, the, you're exactly right, there's the early adopters. They want to see how does the technology of the future work even today so they can get a feel for how it works now so they're ready in two or three years time when it is available in much bigger volumes, they can yeah. go, yeah, we, we know this stuff, Let, yeah. let's go. Okay. So norm, right now it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of one business to business kind of transaction, working where there's good mutual, kind of, mutual synergies to make it work well for us. But I, I'd love to give it to you and stick it on your roof, but unfortunately we don't have enough of it right now. So it's a, it's a bit of a supply challenge. Yeah. 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 Well, there's a business in Cambridge yeah. that would love to try them <laughs> out. So. But too, yeah, we, we don't say no straight away to anyone, right? Yeah, so yeah. There's, a, there's always a chance, right? Where there's a good uh, possibility of interaction, where we can learn something from your installation, where we can kind of understand how this performs in a different scenario. So in two or three years time when we want to, you know, sell like, pallets and pallets and pallets of this stuff, we can say, hey, we, we did this a few years ago and it worked really well in Cambridge. So you, you know, yeah. so having those chances to learn, it's, it's a really good thing for us too. Awesome. Yeah. So in terms of real world efficiency, yeah. you mentioned obviously this is your gen one module, yeah. it's like 23.8% yeah. right now. Yeah. Where are you aiming for, say by, I don't know, 2030, what would you hope to be at by then? Yeah, I think, so we know that there's a lot of improvements we can make at a module level right now. So we, we know that next year we're gonna have a 26% module. We've already made prototypes of that design and, and had it validated by a third party and said you know, that there is a 26% full area module that we, we've built and made. Uh, I think with improvements both to the module and the cell, we expect a 30% module by 2030. I think that's, that's, a de that's a definite, tangible goal that we've got in mind. Yeah, wow, that's impressive. Yeah, it, it will be, it will be, yeah. How does bifaciality tie Ooh. into this? Like, are these bifacial panels? Are yeah, there? like every kind of module we can make in bifacial, this is a bifacial version. We've yeah. got a, a black or a white one over there that you can, depending on which exact application. Yeah. But it, it really works a bit like a silicon standard yeah. cell for bifacial things. And it's, yeah. you know, it's what a lot of people need, especially if you're putting in a field, you can get an extra 20% energy yield or something like that, depending on the installation. So absolutely, bifaciality is a big thing. We're, we're ready for it. It's, yeah. it's a bit hard to measure in a tandem cell. There's some new challenges for like the measurement industry, how to, how to catch up with that, how to yeah. in, get the right kind of test protocols in place to make it sure that people know what they're getting. But in principle, they're actually delivering it is, is fine. And we, we've, we've got some of these panels on our roof in Brandenburg uh, yeah. where they've been showing, yeah, it really works. You get, you get that gain that you expect from a bifacial, yeah. a bifacial module. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Dan, thank you so much for sharing hey, Jordan, all this knowledge with us. Yeah, good Glad to see to you. Meet him. Yeah, thanks. Well, we'll look forward to fitting our first perovskite panels at some point in the future maybe on our own HQ, you never know. But I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, there'll be two videos up here that YouTube thinks you'll enjoy. Why not settle in and watch one of those?